Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for You Can Be a Much Better Teacher, Even If You're a Parent. Um, when, uh, when I was asked about the possibility of presenting as part of the Emergency Home Learning Summit, I thought, oh, that'd be cool. I, I, I think there are some ideas that might be useful uh, that I can share out there. So I will endeavor to do so over the next half hour or so, and, and perhaps there will be something useful to you. So there we go. Now, my name is Rushton, Rushton Hurley. And I am a former high school teacher of Japanese language. Uh, I've taught some other things at the middle school and college level as well. Uh, and then I became a principal. I was principal of a K-12 school and then principal of an online high school. Uh, and then in 2005, I started Next Vista for Learning, my own little nonprofit I'll tell you more about in a second. Uh, and I would also note that uh, I married up. That is to say that when I met my wife in 1994, I had an inkling that I had just won life's lottery. So I recognize that, there you go. Anyway, so Next Vista for Learning, uh, my, little, my little nonprofit shindig is mainly a library. It's a library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a student audience, all screen content, my own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance one creative video at a time. Ooh. Now, in this library, you're going to find lots of videos about academic topics, uh, light bulbs, we call that, global views, communities around the world, seeing service, service to others. We have videos uh, about advice for teens, uh, videos to help those learning English, uh, and videos for careers. We have a lot of stuff uh, in, in our library, and hopefully the, the very free and ad-free nature of all of this might be something that would be useful to what you do. That's at nextvista.org. All right, so I have for you today seven suggestions. And whether you are a parent working to support the learning of your child or a teacher teaching uh, uh, at a distance or whatever it may be, I hope that, that these seven ideas are, are ideas that will make you better at what you do, help inspire your student to see things that he or she may not have seen before, uh, and that just generally take a little stress off your shoulders. So. The first one we're going to look at uh, is, is questions, and, and you should be expecting questions. Now, that's not merely a prediction. Hey, expect that there will be questions. Actually, it's more than that. Uh, the idea is that you should set the expectation that there will be questions. So there are a number of ways that, uh, that we, we set things in motion in schools and classes uh, when teaching that, uh, that actually kind of give somewhat the, the wrong impression on our students with, and that we do this inadvertently, right? And one of them is we'll say, you know, we'll say things like, uh, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, which is a very different question than what questions do you have? So if you ask, does anyone have any questions? The students might well be interpreting that as, is there anybody kind of so slow and idiotic that you just didn't understand and need to announce that to everybody? Now, that's obviously not what the teacher means, but what matters is what they hear, not what you say, right? So when we think about the idea of, of trying to get people in the right space regarding questions, let them know everybody should have questions. We, sh we should have questions. First of all, you're, you're saying something about humility. I am not so amazing a teacher that every time I teach something, everybody gets it perfectly. That should be obvious to everybody. But on the other hand, uh, you know, students kind of have in themselves kind of that that space of, well, you know, I, I don't want to look stupid. I mean, that, that's a really strong thing in the mind of a child. But if, but if you have essentially created an environment where people are excited about the ideas, uh, and that's no, no, in no small part a function of getting them to say, hey, so what about this? How does this work? What if? And, and those kinds of questions, if you've made real time for that, as opposed to, well, we got another two minutes. Anybody, anybody, any questions? Instead, if what you've done is said, hey, I know you've got questions and I know you've got good questions and, and let's work with them. And, and then that kind of gives you an avenue for, for working with what they say and bringing it back to what it is you're teaching, which is a really important thing because their ideas will fashion your statements in a way that they are more valuable to the, the students, the children. And so what you wanna do is, is build this culture of, we always have questions. What questions do you have? What, what connections can you, can you spot? How does this relate to other things that we've done? What do you think? What comes to mind? Those, those kinds of discussions in class, that kind of uh, very exploratory culture is something that uh, allows for much more effective learning, uh, a much better environment for moving forward than if we're just saying, well, does anybody happen to, you know, does anybody not understand, right? Or, or, or anything along those lines. 
So there are any number of tools that can be useful. I'm not going to focus heavily on tools in, in, uh, in this presentation, but just some that you should know. Padlet, for example, is, uh, is, a, is a space where you can have this, this board and, and click, you can double click on it and put your name and add a question. So, so anybody could add things in there. That's interesting. In that you don't have to type your name, uh, you can do this anonymously. And so when you think about fostering an environment where people can ask questions, there are going to be times when you want to do it anonymously and times when you want to do it uh, you know, by name. So, so if, if you want to know what people, uh, what people are thinking you know, kind of purely, then making it anonymous might mean that they're willing to ask a question that they were worried would be seen as a stupid question by others if their name were attached to it. So, so one of the things you can think in terms of whether you are uh, whether you are passing out pieces of paper and people writing on on them and passing them back, or using something like Padlet, or Google Jamboard, or Google Forms, or whatever it may be, uh, is, is to give them the opportunity to respond uh, anonymously with their questions. Now, ideally, you know, you you build this environment where people are completely comfortable saying, "So, what about this?" and and everybody's like, "Huh," and and everybody's kind of in that space of. The person may be asking a question that is much more interesting than, than you originally recognize. Uh, and that's a really healthy way of looking at the other people in the room and building a great atmosphere and making for some great learning. So that's our first one, expect questions, or set that expectation. A second one is to team up with others. Now, there are a lot of ways that, uh, that, that, that teachers fail to do this, uh, parents as well, right? Where we think, okay, I'm teaching, I have to build everything from scratch. Uh, you know, that, that thing of reinventing the wheel, like it was a good idea, it's not. So, so there are going to be times when you want to really craft something that's you, builds on your experiences, things that you're bringing to the table. And, you know, as you may know, when you are teaching anything and you can tie it to things that are a part of who you are, your story, that's all the more powerful for the students, all the more powerful to listen you know, to as, as a child. Um, but there are lots of things that you might teach for which lots of other people have created great content that's out there. So you can, you can find this stuff in different places. You imagine Curriki, C-U-R-R-I-K-I dot O-R-G, for example, uh, is a good place to go for, for different kinds of lesson plans that are out there. It's all free. The hyperdocs.co site has samples that you might want to take a look at as well. Teachers uh, very, you know, very generously create cool things and share them there. And that's, that's celebrated in that setting. Uh, you can even do searches where you, where you look for things via, say, file type. So if you are looking for something on haiku poetry and you, you type in haiku poetry, file type colon PPT, no spaces, right? File type colon PPT. That means that all of the results in Google would be PowerPoint files. Uh, and you might find that, that uh, in looking at the addresses that it comes from some school district, and so you take a look and if you like it, use it and just cite your source. Hey, here's something I got from the school district in Illinois. Awesome that they made this available. Totally fine to do, but there's just no need to reinvent the wheel. So, so one of the things in the team up category is just to team up with colleagues worldwide. Loads of people have put great things out there, tap into them, use them, all good. The other thing is to just understand that, uh, that in working with other parents, in working with other teachers, you've got, you've got plenty of uh, ability to what I call vary the voice, V-A-R-Y the voice, right? Uh, what we want is for, for kids to, to, to constantly be coming back to, okay, oh, how does that work? All right, all right, what is this person saying? And, and in doing that, mm -hmm. uh, if we just keep presenting the same way all the time, it gets hard for them to stay, uh, to stay in gear on that. Uh, and so, so being willing, for example, to have another teacher do an activity in, in your class, maybe recorded as well, you can do it that way. Uh, maybe having, you know, a parent, you know, kind of switch off with you for two consecutive days where, where you do a little activity together, but you each bring something a little different to it. Even in your voice, you're bringing something different to it. And that, that's interesting for, for a student, for a child to take that moment where they stop and they go, huh, you know, Here's, here's a different person. And, and, and it, we're just kind of more likely to listen to someone who's kind of new on the scene, uh, assuming that they don't immediately turn us off. Um, but I think that, that when you begin to, to say, all right, you know, I can work with somebody else on this, a lot of possibilities open up. When we think about what we're dealing right now with so much distance learning and uh, you know, the pandemic and all of these things, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is that our, our, our limitation on class size before was mostly a function of the room and union contracts perhaps. But, uh, but you know, let's say you've got 30 students and another teacher has 30 students and you're teaching the class at the same time. 
why not have one of you teach all 60 if it's just a Zoom space, right? I mean, why not? Uh, and that gives you the chance to really watch somebody else present content. Uh, you can then do the same in reverse for that person. There's, a, there's not a lot of reason not to, right? I mean, you know, you always are going to get some new insights by watching somebody else do something. Your kids may come back and say, I really enjoyed this or this, this aspect of that or, or how she explained this. Those kinds of moments are, are very valuable for learning. And so, you know, take the opportunity now to both take some of the work off your plate so that you can be more creative and be there for kids who need something, right? Uh, and to, to get insights from, from colleagues, you know, so as parents working together on homeschooling things, as teachers working together on distance learning things, this is all something that, that is easy enough to do. All right, third piece of advice. We all get annoyed from time to time. You know, we all have those moments where it's like, wow, that just annoyed me in a big whopping way. And, and so that happens. It happens to us all. Fine. Maybe there's the occasional like, uh, you know, Buddha-like figure who, who teaches who's like, ah, an interesting question. You know, yes, I mean, maybe. But more to the point, we have these moments where, where our initial reaction is going to teach as much as anything else we teach you know, the rest of the week, month, or year. And so given that, buy yourself time. If you know that someone just pushed a button of yours, buy yourself time. Wow, that's an interesting thing to say, young man. I'll tell you what, you and I will talk about that right after class, not a problem. You're not, you're not in trouble, at least not yet. So we'll just talk then. And that's probably a good idea. And then just keep going on with what you're doing. De-escalating a, a point of conflict uh, happens, you know, like not often enough, right? And, uh, and it's really good for students to see that, uh, that there are adults who can respond to, uh, to being provoked with, with kind of calm and, uh, you know, in an intelligent uh, moment with, ah, hmm, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. And of course, you've got some tools to deal with that. I mean, things like, you know, muting a student or putting them in a waiting room or whatever it may be. But, but hopefully, you're actually buying the student the same kind of time as well, because students need that kind of time. You know, if, if they're really annoyed about something, maybe it's something going on in their lives, have nothing to do with you, but you just happen to be the one talking to them and they say something, you know, for a, a bit intense. Um, they may need a moment where a teacher says, hmm, let's talk about this uh, in about 20 minutes when the class ends and, and I'm sure we'll be all right. Uh, and then that may give them the chance to kind of calm down a bit. Remember that when kids say things that push your buttons, they they may well be coming from an environment where at home everyone pushes everyone's buttons like that's how they communicate you know that's that's a terrible thing but it happens and so if you are the kind of calm stable adult who can say hmm let me check in with you a little later on that and then after class ends and everybody else leaves or you know or whatever you know you can just say so are you all right you know and and, and asking a question like that you know can can really put a child in the right place for uh, for you know, for stopping and saying, no, I'm not, you know, I mean, like, you know, my, my dog ran away yesterday and, and, you know, and suddenly it's like, oh, all right, you know, I mean, so, so yeah, the kid, you know, the kid kind of blew up in class, but the kid's worried about his dog. Oh, okay. That happens. Um, so, so if, if we are, if we're kind of cognizant of when we are getting angry and the first thing we, we think of, you know, through practice is buy yourself time, that can be healthy. Fourth piece of advice, know the summary. What do I mean by that? So whenever you're doing a lesson, you should have clearly in your mind that these are the main points of the lesson, right? And, and it shouldn't be like five minutes worth of these are the main points. It should be like, boom, 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 boom. That's the main point. And, and if you can articulate those easily, that simplifies a lot for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, those of us teaching in, in classes have, always, have had those moments where, you know, kids show up the next day and they're like, so... Did we do anything in class yesterday? Uh, and you, you think to yourself, you know, um, we did. Um, we actually did quite a bit of learning. Uh, there were a lot, and, and you know, you're, you're trying not to get snarky about it. No, all we did was just stare at each other. I mean, you know, no, you, you, you want to say something useful. And, and, and genuinely, actually, the kid probably just means, what did we do in class today? But that doesn't have the sophistication to, to craft the sentence in such a way that it would, would come across better. So if instead you have this very clear sense of, well, here were the main things yesterday. Now we're going to talk about those a little bit more today, but I wanted you to make sure you're know, like, these are the main ideas and we'll, you know, we'll be building on those. And then when you start class, those main ideas, the summary ideas 
often what happens teachers will, you know will get started and say all right we're going to review the main points of yesterday's class ah lost opportunity right what what that could have been was all right guys now let's come up with the main points from yesterday's class get them doing the work of remembering what it was if you can put them in little breakout rooms or whatever so that they have kind of a quick conversation with each other there was this there was this oh yeah there was that okay all right what did we do yesterday and you know getting help from each other that's active you want classes to start with some active energy that's a big deal, right? Otherwise, they're like, uh, while you just kind of think, oh, there was this, there was this, there was one of these, right? And, and instead, you know, try to get them, you know, into that space where they know that's part of their job is to say, oh, we talked about this, we talked about this, uh, I think it connected to this. And you go from being the person who spoon feeds them a bunch of review to being a person who just makes sure they don't forget anything really, really important. So, so the summary can be can be a really useful way, I mean, just to think about, not just how you help kids review, not just how they stop and they say, okay, well, um, you, you know, these were the main things we covered, but, but you've got this sense of, you know, here's our lesson, here are the things we're going to do as a part of it, but here's the core. Here are the things you need to know. The kind of things you can say again at the end of class. Hey guys, before you leave, what were the main things? And, and then just get them to say them again, because the reiteration of those main points makes it all the easier for them to recall what it, what it was it got covered when the time comes to be assessed on it or just to uh, review the main points actively the next day. Fifth thing to work with is the idea of choice. So providing choice, this, this, is, this is another way underused piece of, of good teaching, right? So, so what am I talking about? Well, there, there's a number of, of different pieces in place here, but, uh, but, but one of the things to know is that uh, when, when you think of choice, often we think of assignments, and that's, that's a, kind of exactly where I want to start with it. So, you know, what kind of assignment do you give? All right, I want you to write a one-page paper about boom, 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 boom. Kid may not hear a squat about what you say after that. What they heard was one-page paper. They now have a goal. Get to the end of the page. You could have been talking about you know, the magic of, of writing creatively for this kind of audience, and you, know, you could have talked all, and you know, one page paper, one page paper. Uh, so for a lot of students, the operative question is, what's the minimum I have to do? And, and if that is it, then you want to kind of stop and say, well, what is it we do in these assignments that, that allow them to, uh, to push themselves in some interesting ways? And choice is, is a good on-ramp to that highway. So if what you do is you say, all right, all right, we're going to be exploring this and this. You're going to be describing these things, perhaps in these ways. And uh, and how are we going to how are we going to do this? Well, the default is a one-page paper, but some of you might say, I don't really want to write a one-page paper. And you believe you can show me that you have learned this in some other way. And if you believe that, and you are willing to make the case for that, then any time between now and Friday, whatever Friday, right? Now and Friday, you can come and you can say. Uh, Mr. Hurley, I want to be able to do this. I want to create a presentation and show it to the class. I want to do interpretive dance. I mean, you know, wh whatever it might be. And, and whatever it is, they have to make the case. And you can say, hmm, you're not making the case to me that you're really showing you understand the basics of, of, of the ideas and how you're going to connect them to interesting things. But come, come back to me later. And if you can kind of tweak that a bit, maybe we can do that. Or you might say, I really like that as a way to do it. You know, may, have some fun with it. You know, show us what you can do. That sounds really cool. Giving students the chance to kind of come at things from a different angle uh, sets in motion a lot of good things. So, for example, uh, you know, maybe what you, you ask is you ask for students to uh, do, do, do a write-up on something, but if they want to do it differently, they can. What that means is they start thinking about it earlier rather than get it done at the last minute. Uh, they start thinking, you know, what can I bring to it? Because, you know, hopefully what we're doing is we're, we're, bringing, we're bringing a lot more audience into it. So if they're presenting to the class or making a video, for example, now everybody sees it. One of the most important things to know about student quality, this is something I've been saying for years, right, is if students know that others will see their work, they want it to be good. If it is just for the teacher, they want it to be good enough. And that difference is very important for how we think of quality. So, so let's think in terms of like, okay, students are beginning to put stuff together. And then on a day, you know, some of the kids turn in their one page paper, but some of the kids share a video that we all watch and you've watched it first to make sure. Um, and then when you, when you show it, 
maybe the students respond and like, hey, that was really cool. That was cool. Now the bar has been set. And so if you do this early enough and you continue to come back to show me, show me what you can do with that, you know, give us a shot, see what you can do. And there are going to be moments where the kids are going to have fun showing off for each other in how they're telling the stories of their learning. Your job just becomes holding their feet to the fire with regard to the academic content. But, but in doing that, you are not only making it more interesting for them, bringing out more quality in their work, you're making it better for you. Because if you just have to do the same thing over and over, one page paper, one page paper, one page paper, I mean, granted, learning to write a one page paper is not an unimportant skill, but how many times do you want to do that? So, so giving people a little space might be a really good way to get them going. Um, if we think of, the, of the, the default piece that I mentioned before as well, let, let's talk about that for a minute. So, so one of the things that happens when, when you give people choice is you have certain kids that are like, eh, 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 right? And, and they, need, they need to know, well, what, what, am I, what am I supposed to do? And sometimes that's because they're just not very interesting with their academic work. Sometimes it's because they're completely stressed about everything else and they just need to focus in on the minimum. So by saying there is a default, as opposed to you may choose from among these, instead of doing that, just here's the default, do this, or you can get something else approved you're giving them space to be like, all right, I'm, I'm just going to do that. Uh, and that, that can be helpful to kids who need to see what other kids can do before their creative juices start to flow and, and they can bring new things to it. Uh, and, and, and I think that if, if you get back to this piece of what it brings to you, you want to have moments where kids do stuff in class, do stuff as a part of their learning, show, you know, your child shows you at home, this is what I put together and you're impressed because it wasn't what you were expecting. Why wasn't it what you were expecting? Because you gave them room to do something other than the default. Therefore, your expectations might have, you know, been like, mm, you know, and they bring something and they get you all excited. And you're like, wow, that's really, really cool. And those are powerful, powerful moments for kids. Uh, you know, the, the basic idea is that by changing audience, uh, we're, we're giving them room to bring a lot more quality to their work and it can be a lot more fun for them and for you. Sixth suggestion, understand that you are not omniscient. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, there are a lot of ways that, uh, that, that this, this idea doesn't get followed, right? There's a lot of uh, people out there who, when faced with a question they don't know, engage in what we will call a certain amount of uh, bovine excrement. And, and kids actually get very good very quickly at understanding when, when, teacher, uh, you know, when a teacher or an adult is, uh, is just talking out of their wazoo. Um, and so consequently, you know, we, need to, we need to take the opportunity to, to model curiosity. Now, now, some teachers will say, I don't know, why don't you research that and bring it back tomorrow? As in, I will now put work on you for having asked that question, which is to say to them, don't ask questions right? Because they don't want to put more work on themselves. But if you're modeling real curiosity and you're saying, wow, see, now that is an interesting question. How would we find it out? Ideas, ideas in the room, what, what, what would we do? And you, you begin a discussion that is designed to bring people in based on something unexpected. Somebody else brought something up. So that's interesting. It captures attention. But it also means that you can, you can practice the ability to bring them back to the main points of the discussion as you go. But, but they're involved, they have a role to play that, that's actually quite exciting for them. So model curiosity, you know, be, be perfectly willing to say, no idea, Let, let's see what we can find out. What, what are the things that come to mind? You know, and, and we may guess some things. I, I, as the teacher, may guess some things that are completely and totally wrong. It happens, you never learn if, if, you, if you shy away from the stuff you don't know. And we certainly need our students to be in that space of uh, recognizing when they have trouble uh, with, with content because it's just it's just kind of new to them or something along those lines. I actually uh, remember a moment teaching Japanese. You know, one, one of the things you do teaching Japanese is you, you teach the syllabary to begin with, syllabary. It's like an alphabet is the letters, syllabary is the syllables. So that's the phonetic piece of Japanese. Uh, written Japanese is, is syllables and characters that they got hundreds and hundreds of years ago from the Chinese, just so you know. But anyway, the syllables are phonetic. And so in teaching them to write these things, you, you give them little uh, mnemonic devices to be like, this is how to remember it. So new, for example, looks like chopsticks and a noodle, right? So you can be like, okay, so chopsticks and a noodle. All right, there we go. That's new. And people see the chopsticks and the noodle, noodle new. All right. Well, so there, there's another syllable, ho, H-O. Um, and uh, that was one that had this really kind of lame mnemonic, you know, and, but I kept using it. It was the only thing I had. And then one day, years into my teaching, 
one of the students said, hey, you know, if you put it on your side, it looks like there's an H and an O there. Oh, and, and I was stunned. I, just, I looked at this syllable. I don't know how many thousand times. I'm like, oh my God, yes. And I got all excited. I'm like, that's brilliant. Okay, that's gonna be that's gonna be the Michael rule. Actually, I don't remember exactly what the student's name was, but still, it was one of those things where it was like, okay, yes, yes. And, and so the kids knew that this one kid had seen something interesting. That's a powerful moment. And, and by and by sharing your enthusiasm for those moments, you know, you're you're creating a different vibe in the classroom that is different than oh, I know it all, because you don't. All right, so there's a there's there's a good piece of advice for you. You're not omniscient, don't pretend you are. Last idea ditch the cape, ditch the cape. What am I talking about with this? All right. So being a superhero uh, is something that sounds pretty darn good, right? Swoop in and save the day. Um, I've got a friend, Lisa Heifel, who has this wonderful uh, talk that she gives uh, about, uh, about this very topic and, and about, you know, what it means to, to help a child really, you know, really, really hit his or her stride. And, uh, and, and in doing this, you know, she shows a video and the video has like a mama duck and a bunch of ducklings. Hard not to like ducklings, right? But, but what's happening in this video is you've got like mama duck coming along, ducklings behind, and they get to some steps. And so mama duck goes whoop and, and goes up. And what you can do as a duckling is, you know, kind of flap a bit and, and jump and you can make it. Well, the ducklings one by one, you know, give it a shot and a bunch of them get over quickly and a few more and then a few more. And then there's one duckling left. And that one duckling is, is, is down there and can't seem to make it up to the next step. And so, you know, as, as adults, as teachers, as parents, we want to swoop in and save the day. Get that duckling, move them up, we'll all move on. Except that, that teaches the duckling, the kid, that you are needed to make it happen, which is not the point of teaching them. The, the idea is to teach them that they can make it happen on their own. So in watching this video, the mama duck, you know, is just kind of waiting and just waiting. It's a little painful for us because we're used to swooping in and saving the day, right? The cape. Um, but ultimately, the duckling makes it. Now, I understand that there are more complex nuances to this story of, of you know, how, how you help people get to where they need to be. But truth be told, there's very little that's as powerful as, uh, as the moment where a kid is having real difficulty doesn't get the, the enabling, uh, you know, superhero kind of treatment that we've talked about and actually figures it out, I can do it. That moment is so important in learning. And so, so if you ditch the cape, you can optimize the chance that that kind of thing will happen. All right, so those are seven pieces of advice for you. I hope that's useful for you. Uh, the idea of you know, set an expectation that there are questions, you know, build those kinds of discussions as you go, team up with others because that saves you from reinventing the wheel. If you get annoyed, buy yourself time, real, real useful move there. Know the summary, right? So, so you can really hit the main points of any given thing that you're trying to teach over, over a lesson, a unit, a day, whatever it might be. Uh, provide choice in what you do. Providing choice is, is a great way to get kids to begin to really show what's, what they're capable of doing rather than just whatever minimum might be asked. Uh, remember that you are not omniscient. Nope, no, no, you're not. Uh, and then finally, ditch the cape. All right. So don't don't enable students to just need somebody else to do it for them, but but help them along those lines. And then there was a picture of a Starbucks cup. What's that about? Well, uh, I hope you will you will actually take a look at uh, at uh, nextvista.org/newsletter. Nextvista.org/newsletter. And in doing that, uh, you can sign up for my little newsletter. Uh, I, I put something out once a month. It's got all kinds of things you might want to watch or read or try. Uh, useful things for, for anybody engaged in education, parent, teacher, either way, uh, and some very good videos. I, I find loads of great things that I, I get to share. And I give away a Starbucks card every month, sometimes more than that. And you're like, wow, I mean, how many people do you send this newsletter out to? About 8,000. That's crazy. I'd never win. Ah, well, accept that. Only so many of them open the email, click on the link, get into the, the newsletter, and then actually do what's asked to do in order to be in the drawing for the email. Well, what's that? Usually watch about a 90 second video and, and give me your thoughts on it. That's it. That's it. That's crazy easy. I know. Crazy, huh? But often we'll get like the number, the number of people who enter can be counted on one hand. Crazy. All right. So I hope you'll, you'll give that a shot. I write a blog at rushtonh.com, R-U-S-H-T-O-N-H.com. And I hope that that is a, a useful thing for you to uh, take a look at and get some ideas from. I've written books books on how to become a better teacher. So 50 ideas in very short chapters with the idea that you can, 
You, know, you, you can kind of read something, you know, in, in two to three pages and just be like, huh, maybe I'll try that uh, right after right after lunch or whatever it might be. Totally fine to do. Second book, uh, Making Your School Something Special, is, is a book about fostering great learning moments uh, to become how you communicate the successes of your school to your team and your community. Uh, and then last December, a new book, Technology, Teamwork, and Excellence, a way to help uh, help create the best kind of personal and professional environment at your school through different kinds of tech. Uh, the idea is to actually use tech to support already good ideas, right? It's not just about tech. So, you know. Now, uh, I hope that you got some good things out of this presentation. I hope you'll stay in touch with me. Uh, you can get me at rh at nextvista.org. Uh, I answer every email I get eventually. Uh, you'll find the video library at nextvista.org. You know, see what all of these kids and teachers around the world have contributed. Lots of good stuff there. I'm on Twitter at, at Rushton H. I was a little late to Instagram, so I'm at, at Rushton was taken. Hope you get that. Uh, there are pun, uh, tons of resources at uh, nextvista.org slash resources. You can get to the newsletter at nextvista.org slash newsletter. Sign up uh, and, uh, and then follow the instructions. You know, when, when like a little Starbucks. And then finally, uh, these slides, tinyurl.com slash rh-ehls20, as in Emergency Home Learning Summit, ehls20. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to send them my way. I hope that, uh, that we'll have the chance to perhaps even highlight some of the work that you or your students do in our video library sometime in the near future. Take care, and may you have a wonderful finish to 2020. Thanks for joining us.